Is and that what you think like a good architecture does is support this iterative approach, support um, the quicker delivery of, of, of new stuff to production? That That's what a, a good architecture does or is there more to it than that for you? Um, essentially, that's exactly what a good architecture does. Pe people say that the Agile Manifesto doesn't talk about design and therefore you should not do upfront design to, to kind of echo the same thoughts. And I, I've seen teams go from big upfront design to basically nothing and they've realized that's now also a bad idea. And in order to move fast, in order to embrace change and deliver stuff quickly and, and use all of the DevOps tools and CI CD tools to kind of move fast and, and deliver stuff properly in a, in a structured, more engineering based way, you need a good design. One of the principles in the Agile Manifesto actually says um, a continuous approach to, to good design enhances agility. You don't get a good design just by hacking code for free. Yeah, no. You have to put some thought into it. And although I, I completely agree that we need to think about stuff in an evolutionary way because we're going to get changes and we need to pivot and change direction, I think you still need a starting point. Not all mm -hmm. of the starting yeah. point, but no. a starting point with some principles in place so that allow, that allows you to create that good structure, the high degrees of modularity, so you can move fast. So yeah, it's, it's a blended okay, so, approach. So I feel me. that that you're saying that your design should evolve with your product and with the things that you learn from pushing stuff out. But you mentioned you want to get some stuff in place in the beginning already. He, like, did, he, did, he did. Hold, hold on. He didn't quite say that. If you um, <laughs> uh, forgive me for putting words in your mouth, what he said. Is that you, you? You start off with a model. Yeah. You start off with a with, 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 an, with, idea. with, with an idea for yeah. what your design might be. I would couch that from an engineering principle: is that you start off with a model like that and assume that it's wrong. Okay. That's the step to engineering. Okay. To, to, to me. Yeah. So you assume that it's wrong, and then you work in a way so that when you find out where it's wrong, you can correct it. Yeah. Right. And that's very different to big design up front because when people did big design up front all those years ago. They assumed they were right, and they assumed that yes. set of blueprints <clears throat> they yeah. come up with was the thing they should yeah. always aim for. So I think we're saying, have a starting point, but okay. be prepared for that to change. And of course, DevOps and CI and CD give us the tools to make those changes easier if you have a good architecture in the first place. Yes. Okay. So what are the stuff? What is the stuff that you would focus on first? Like if you uh, you know where you want to go in the, in the long term, and what kind of architecture you would need, what kind of design you would need to to like support the final product. But you're not going to build all of it at once, right? right? What are like the non-negotiables? What's the stuff that you uh, always need, even if you start out with your first version that you're pushing out? Do you mind if I take that first? Because I, I think I can lead you, set you up for fleshing more <laughs> yeah, detail. <that's> right. <laughs> so from an engineering point of view, the things that I would describe are all about managing complexity. Right. I would start to try and identify ways of compartmentalizing the system so that I'm able to understand the pieces and change them without affecting other parts of the system. Right. And I would say that's a deeply profound and important aspect of architecture and design. And then, you know, that if you're able to do that, so if you're able to build systems that are more modular, uh, more cohesive, good separation of concerns, good yeah. lines of abstraction, tending towards t being more loosely coupled between those those pieces, that that's the kind of defense that you then have to allow you to find out you yeah. screwed up and made a mistake and change things and, and manage, make the code, you know, a habitable space that you can change. And I think Simon's stuff, as I understand it, takes that, you know, gives you tools that allow you to achieve that, yeah. those kinds of ends. Yeah, I was going to say, it's literally <coughs> the same thing. So uh, Grady Booch has a great definition about software architecture. He says uh, software architecture is about the significant decisions. Yeah. All of that stuff is significant decisions. It's your key tech choices that you can't really change later. It's your overriding modularity strategy, whether you're building a monolith or some yeah. microservice or something in between. And again, it's, it's how do we make this thing so that we can change it in the future without having this horrible blast radius effect that you know you make change here and everything yeah. blows up. Yeah, and I'd, I'd argue to some degree that architecture is nearly all about that 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 manage, management of complexity. Yeah, it allows us to build systems that are beyond the scale that we can hold in our heads, or at least a part of it of the system that you can hold in your head. Yeah, right. yeah. Where well, you compartmentalize yeah. it so that each piece fits in your head. We've seen a lot of the practices from the big players that have moved into the common domain. Um, if we look at technologies like containers, orchestration, um, 
more than ever, the, the ways that we can do pipelines has been commoditized. Um, you can do that on, on so many platforms now. With great power also comes great responsibility. Um, do you think that people are hurting th themselves with, with these technologies as well? I do. Yeah, I do too. I, and and I, it's, there's, there's, there's an elephant in the room, so let's uh, name the <laughs> elephant. I, I think that people get microservices wrong all of the time. I, I, I think that microservices have become... Mo most of the clients that I, I... I'm like Simon, I'm an independent consultant, and most of the teams that I see that claim to be adopting microservices aren't, by the definition of microservices, doing so. And where they start is, you know, if they're starting something new, they start by assuming that they understand what are the services, setting up a separate, creating a separate repo, and then starting working each of those things. What they've just done is built latency into the point at which they want to iterate quickly in order to be able to learn. Yeah. So the other aspect of engineering is to optimize for learning. So you want really fast, clear feedback. If my service is in one repository and Simon's is in another, every time the conversation between those services changes to the smallest degree, you know, either I've got to go and dip in his or he's got to dip. It, and it's a nightmare. If we put them all in one big repo, we still have nice service-oriented designs, yes. but, but probably 90% of the time, my IDE will tell me that I've screwed up his service. Can you do that? Can you like take that a step further? And when you're starting out, team is still small, company is still small, not just put it all in one repo, like host it all in one process. Or do you think that's yeah. like a horrible idea? No, that, that, that yeah. would be my recommended starting point for 95% plus of teams out yeah. there. Yeah. I actually did a talk at a GoTo conference, I think it was a GoTo Berlin a few years ago called Modular Monoliths. Yeah. Same thing. I have a very similar talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, think there, there, I think there are a few people now with talks that they're finally becoming fashionable again. I've seen a the same thing, a whole bunch of people who've got this like 10, 15 year old Java legacy application. It's a horrible mess. They, it's brittle. Yeah. They can't change it. And they say, we're going to convert to microservices. And what they do is they take their existing design thinking, their approach to modularity, which is not very good because that's what got into the mess. Yeah. And they basically stick JSON over HTTPS network links between things yeah. in their monolith. That could have been in process calls. Yeah, and yeah. right. And, and now the boundaries are wrong. The boundaries are hard to change. And you've yeah. got something which is lockstep deployable, brittle, fragile, and slow. And yeah, they mm. just don't get, there's a very different mindset shift there. Because don't get me wrong. I mean, at a certain scale, you're going to want separate services, but Maybe. I mean, Facebook, Shopify, there are some big modular models yeah. out there. Shopify have got a huge big thing on their engineering blog yeah. uh, over the past few years about how they've changed their Ruby on Rails model to become much more modular because they mm -hmm. were running into issues. I'd, I'd, I'd argue that modularity is always good, but not necessar you don't necessarily need inter-process communications yeah. all over the place. And often you don't need multi-threading in lots of places where people no. put it. And that all of those things, both, well, both of those things, you know, amp up the complexity by an order of magnitude yeah. at least. Yeah. I, I, not I, I not am, just I, the complexity, also like the, the, the how hard it will be to debug, how hard it will be to trace. To like, I mean, and even just deploy, just yeah, just, well, to, just to figure out what, what is yeah. my software doing in production. That becomes extremely yeah. hard. Is that like something that you take on from the get go, like visibility of your systems? Is that something that because to me, that always felt like one of the most important issues that a lot of people seem to be forgetting. This is, yeah, I mean, this is why some big organizations who are very service, microservice focused, they give their teams autonomy, but they have internal engineering and platform teams that bootstrap the product teams and the service teams. So literally, you can pull something out of their internal repo, bootstrap your service, and you get observability free and monitor monitoring for free and deployability for free into the... Yeah production GCP environment, and all of that stuff is taken care of you in a, in a standardized way, and, mm -hmm. and that's fabulous. The, 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 other, the other thing is that, that microservices give you if you do it well and at scale is it's the most scalable way of building big systems because what you do is that you trade off um, uh, consistency yeah. for independence. So the, this is the most distributed approach to development, but it means that if I'm writing a microservice and Simon's writing a microservice, micro I can deploy mine without testing it against his. That's yeah. how good the abstraction is between them. And that's kind of table stakes. You can't really count it as microservices if you can't do that, because that's the decoupling step. Yeah. The point at which we don't no longer care 
about about the details and the pro that means the protocol's got to be stable between us so you've got to be fairly sophisticated in design terms to be able to get to those stable protocols but that requires some really competent architects because oh, yes. that requires both yes. business yeah. knowledge and technical knowledge to define those boundaries in, in the in the right places because our, because otherwise they will be working against you yes. right and that's why most teams should not do this because it's hard yes